to uh, right now call on Vice Chair Steve Piercy for the approval of the minutes. Chairman Kush, I have reviewed the minutes with the exception of one word being misspelled. I find everything in order and would move for their approval. Thank you, that means your time is up. Uh, I, we have a motion for approval. I need a second. We have a second from Commissioner Dodd. All right, uh, I'm gonna take a executive uh, uh, order and change the order of the to meeting tonight. And Mary, if you would come up for the highway department report, uh, yours will be quick, I know, so we will get you on the road. All right, you will find the highway report under the tab. I thought we just did. Do we vote on the minutes? Oh. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, I'm sorry. Any opposed on the minutes? Thank you, Phil. I appreciate it. I got this. to go a little too, I was going a little too fast. Thank All right. you, thank you. Um, good evening, sirs. Um, I'm bringing before you three uh, speed limits, 25 miles an hour for Deerfield subdivision, 25 miles an hour on Milesdale Lane, and 25 miles an hour on Rehoboth Road. These were all suggestions um, from the Sheriff's Department. This went through our road board this morning with unanimous voting on approval. All right. Thank you, Chair. Uh, any uh, discussion? All right, we have a motion, I need a second. Okay, sorry, Steve. Uh, all those in favor, approve this highway, thank you. Any opposed? That motion carries. Mary, what else do you have? I don't have anything. If, if y'all don't have questions, I appreciate moving ahead. Thank all you. All right, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, next on the list will be the Waste Away presentation. Uh, I would like to uh, call to the floor. Mark, are you gonna do the main speaking? All right, we also have with you uh, Mike Webb. And Darren, I saw Darren somewhere, if Darren wants to, uh, uh, he was here, okay. All right, uh, they have a, a short PowerPoint presentation. Uh, this, uh, this, what we're doing tonight is a request from uh, members of this committee. Uh, they wanted to get a, uh, for those who did not attend the tour a couple of weeks ago, uh, this is an update on where the city of Murfreesboro and Waste Away is uh, where they are with their partnership and the direction they are heading. Uh, so it is an update for our benefit uh, to know where our counterpart with the city is going. So uh, Mark, you take it away. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I see the mayor stepped out as well. I guess everybody's heard this presentation too many times, but uh, um, I want to thank the members of the commission for this opportunity to update you. And uh, it, as I was looking at my calendar, I believe it's been almost 18 months since I've been up here. Now, I've spoken to several of you. We've had uh, different visits at the uh, um, plant, but uh, since I've actually spoken to the committee, it's been about 18 months. And uh, a lot has happened during that time. As we all know, Rutherford County has been searching for a solution to Middle Point for at least 15 years, probably longer than that. You've hired consultants, you've traveled the world literally looking at technologies, you've issued RFIs and RFPs looking for the right solution for your community. And, uh, and I want to applaud your, your efforts in that. Uh, some might say a mistake was made 30 years ago when Middle Point was, was cited here with some of the things that happened. And uh, you, you want to get it right this time. And uh, the city has built on your effort. Uh, they took some of the research and, and the uh, things that you had done with the RFIs and the RFPs. And I believe they've put together a project and an offer to the county that's really a, a low risk, actually a no risk opportunity for the county to, to help solve this problem. And that's what we're gonna talk about a little bit tonight. Um, let me start by playing just a real quick video because it's probably the fastest way for me to uh, uh, condense what the city and Waste Away are up to. This is actually a video that was produced by the city of Murfreesboro. And if we get through the technical glitches here, we'll see how this works.
Darren Gore, the City of Murfreesboro's Assistant City Manager, has been given the task to come up with a solution to the city's solid waste challenges. Middle Point Landfill will soon be full and won't be capable of accepting any more trash. The City Council showed interest in doing something more environmentally friendly and sustainable instead of just hauling the trash to another landfill. The decision was made to partner with WasteAway, a Warren County-based company in Morrison, Tennessee. They are a technology company that can divert 90% of municipal solid waste trash away from landfills and 70% into a beneficially reusable fuel, labeled SE3, that the EPA says is a coal or wood replacement. Gore was directed by the City Council to develop a project agreement with WasteAway. Because WasteAway had no long-term buyer set up to buy this fuel, the Council had initial concerns. However, the company has proven that the fuel it produces can be used as a feedstock to ultimately generate renewable natural gas. The Waste Away process was developed in conjunction with the Corps of Engineers and was recommended by the Corps for deployment in 2008. Since that time, the EPA has designated SC3 as a safe material and TDEC, which is the Tennessee Department of Environmental and Conservation, has designated SC3 as a soil amendment. Being able to use WasteAway's SE3 fuel as a feedstock to generate renewable natural gas has taken away concerns of a long-term purchaser as renewable natural gas is in high demand. A social and environmental score was given for the choices the city had on what to do with their trash, which are take it to another landfill, take it to a clean materials recovery facility, take it to a dirty materials recovery facility, or take it to Waste Away, where 70% of the end product is a clean, sustainable SE3 biomass fuel. Waste Away scored the highest. The project can be broken down into four main components. One, a material management station or transfer station will have to be built. Two, the manufacturing of the SE3 biomass fuel. Three, anaerobic reactor biogas generation. And four, renewable natural gas purification. Taxpayers will only be funding the transfer station. The other three components will be paid for by revenue generated by WasteAway. The city has approached Rutherford County to see if they are interested in splitting the cost of the material management station proposed to be built off Butler Drive and Joby Jackson Parkway. The Inflation Reduction Act recently passed by Congress has included significant federal subsidies to encourage using the SE3 fuel as a feedstock to generate renewable natural gas. These subsidies could pay for as much as 25% of the project. The Waste Away project financing will be sought through revenue bonds, which will be backed by the project's revenues not the city's general fund. Okay, so that's, that's in the city's own words a real quick synopsis of, of where we are, but, but let me talk about just a few uh, quick points that we need to go over. And, and gentlemen, I'm going to breeze through a lot of this information. Many of you have, have visited the plant. I always feel awkward here with my back to you guys. Oh, that's all right, that's all right. <laughs> um, you, you visited the plant and uh, you've, you've seen the technology work, but um, uh, let me go through just a few points because that is one of the concerns we, we frequently hear with WasteAway. If it's a new technology, there's always risk with new technology, and I understand that. Um, but you know, the, the technology we're talking about began as a collaboration with the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, it's been an R&D 100 winner from uh, R&D Magazine. Uh, it's a winner of U.S. Army Research uh, Product Development Award. We have actually close to 30 U.S. and international patents now. Um, we actually did a five-year continuous 24-7 run to prove the technology works processing uh, the waste that Warren County collects and have had multiple independent engineering reviews. Uh, the, the two most thorough being in 2019, Tectratech did a, a thorough review of the technology and uh, uh, prepared a, a 
report that looks kind of like the Nashville phone book used to. And, uh, and then uh, Mr. Gore and the staff at the city have, have done their own due diligence and another thorough examination of, of what we're up to. And uh, uh, so the, the technology works. And like I said, most of you have seen it work. Um, and then the second and the more common concern has always been what are we going to do with the fuel? If we're going to make, take the waste, convert it into fuel, are we sure we can sell that fuel? And that's certainly the primary comment I've heard from, from this committee in the past. And um, real quick, just in case there's, there's someone that hasn't, isn't familiar with our uh, base technology, uh, maybe some of the, the members in the audience. Uh, the waste away technology, we take the input, in your case, from the county, it would be coming from your high capacity compactors. Uh, that material can be brought to the tipping floor. Uh, we're processing it using magnets, shredders, grinders. Uh, uh, the only thing that's somewhat unique to uh, waste processing would be our steam explosion units and um, processing the waste. And we end up, as the video said, with 70% of the material is a clean biofuel. Uh, we're also pulling out the recyclables and those can be sold based on what's available in the market. Um, but since we were here, well, maybe not all since we were here 18 months ago, uh, in the, the past uh, few years, there have been three big game changers for Waste Away and its applicability to your needs here in uh, Rutherford County. The first game changer was an EPA comfort letter. Uh, that was actually in 2019. <coughs> And they designated the fuel that we produce is a non-waste fuel according to, uh, I won't quote all the, the numbers, you don't care about that, but uh, we are considered a non-waste fuel and can be used to replace coal or wood. And once we obtained that letter, we had a number of industrial users that uh, wanted the fuel, need the fuel, uh, want to reduce their carbon footprint by using the fuel. And then as a, another option, uh, TDEC uh, uh, classifies SE3, our, our fuel product can also be used as a soil amendment. So that gives us another option for using the, the end product. If somewhere down the road years from now, uh, we can't use it as fuel, we can always use it as soil amendment. The next game changer was the commitment that Murfreesboro made. And, and some of you will remember, some of you are, are new to the commission or, or new on the commission since I was last here. And uh, as part of the RFP response that we submitted, we made a proposal to the county that uh, if you were concerned about the fuel markets, we would enter into a study agreement and help verify those fuel markets and find buyers for the fuel uh, for the county. and. Um, didn't hear back from the county on that specifically, but the city approached me shortly after I made that offer and said, uh, hey, would you work with the city if we fund the study? And of course we said, sure. And um, so we entered into a, a contract with the city to verify that uh, there were uses for that fuel and uh, came up with some. Uh, cement kilns, we always knew the cement kilns were uh, interested in, in using the fuel. We have done tests with virtually every uh, major manufacturer of cement in the U.S. today. Um, we obtained an LOI from Argos Cement, which is a $4 billion a year company, um, saying they would take all the fuel, but they wanted to haul it down uh, uh, to the Birmingham area, and that was a long haul, so that was going to be somewhat costly. Uh, so working with Murfreesboro, we actually did a test burn. We actually made some fuel from Murfreesboro garbage, hauled it to Chattanooga, and uh, did a test burn at uh, uh, Boozy Cement Kiln in Chattanooga. And after that test, uh, which Mr. Gore actually went down and attended that test, he wanted to see this fuel in use, not just take our word for it or someone else's. And uh, so he attended the, the test burn and they said they, they want the fuel as well. So uh, the, the solid fuel, we have, I guess now, four different uh, cement companies that are wanting the fuel. Uh, I assume at some point as the project moves forward, as we sell fuel, there'll have to be a competitive process and, and let them compete for who can give us the best deal for the fuel. I can tell you because of the haul bill, 
it's most likely going to Chattanooga because they're going to have the shortest haul. And um, so that was the next thing we we did that and and we continued when I was here last we talked about TVA and the option of uh, producing power and uh, we continue those conversations with TVA um, they are very interested or at least they, they tell me they're very interested but they're just not moving at the speed that we need to move to do a project in a timely way here in, in Rutherford County um, so uh, we'll continue our conversations with TVA, but right now they are not what I would consider the, the lead uh, opportunity for, for doing the project. And then the next game changer was uh, early, well, started to say earlier this year, but earlier last year, uh, a few months ago, in 2022, EPA made a huge commitment to renewable natural gas. And, uh, you know, EPA and the environmental community have decided that uh, we've got to quit putting the, what's called the putrescible trash, in layman's terms, the stuff that can rot, the food waste, some of the paper and cardboard, uh, those materials that we put into our landfills that produce the methane, produce the odors we're all familiar with in this community. Um, they don't want that material going into landfills any longer. And so they have uh, decided to uh, push, nudge, force um, uh, everyone to, to quit uh, putting that material into landfills. And so you ask, well, what do they want us to do with it? Well, they want us to make renewable natural gas. And so we take the, the original waste away process, uh, the garbage trucks dump the material, uh, we process it, we produce SE3, and then we add a new step where we use what's called an anaerobic digester, and I'll show you a picture of that in just a moment, um, to uh, turn the SE3 into uh, renewable natural gas, or a, a large fraction of it anyway. And uh, we, we make that renewable natural gas and sell it at a premium, um, and in order to encourage this change. EPA is doing the same thing they did with ethanol. Um, you know, when I was a kid, now I don't want to get too far off on a story, but I actually came to Murfreesboro to MTSU because Al Gore was doing a, a workshop or whatever about making ethanol out of uh, sawdust at the time, and I had a friend that had a sawmill. We thought we were going to come down here and figure out how to make ethanol to run our boats on. And uh, we figured out with outboard engines it didn't mix with the oil and we left rather quickly. But <laughs> um, So ethanol has been around a long time ago, but no one, at least I didn't back in the 80s and 90s when they started talking about putting ethanol in our gasoline, nobody ever really thought people were going to do that. Well, today, drive around town and try to buy gas that doesn't have ethanol in it. You can find a few places that don't, and they'll have big signs, you know, non-ethanol gas, because everything's E10, E15. Um, we're, we're putting ethanol into everything. And when EPA decided they wanted to, to make that transition, they used a law called the Renewable Fuel Standard. The entire ethanol industry is based on that, and that's how EPA got us all to use ethanol in our, our vehicles. And um, they are using not only the same mechanisms, they're literally using that same law now uh, to encourage the transition to using renewable natural gas made from, from waste, whether it comes from landfills or from digesters, and we'll talk about the difference in a moment, uh, to uh, make the renewable natural gas. And there's all kinds of things happening literally every day. Uh, you know, this, this presentation I did back in December, actually some of these slides Darren had done for a presentation, I guess the first of December for the, the city council. Uh, Archaea, the, the Republican Archaea invested 1.1 billion. I saw a news blurb this morning, they've already sold Archaea to uh, British Petroleum for $4 billion. Um, so everybody's getting in on renewable natural gas. Uh, Congress passed the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, which has incredible incentives for renewable natural gas, and they will actually pay for 25% of the facility as part of that act. And um, ev everywhere we go, everybody's jumping on the renewable natural gas uh, bandwagon and throwing all kinds of federal incentives at it to make it profitable 
and to um, encourage this transition. Let's talk real quick, and gentlemen, I'm not gonna go into a lengthy discussion of anaerobic digestion. Uh, I think most of us are familiar with landfill gas these days where you, you put the garbage in the landfill, it rots for 20 years, and we try to capture the gas before it leaks into the atmosphere. Depending on who you talk to, we can capture anywhere from, California just did a study saying they can only capture about 12% effectively. Uh, some will claim they're capturing as much as half of it. Um, but at the end of the day, it takes 20 years to, to do it anyway, and a lot of it escapes into the atmosphere. With anaerobic digestion, we're doing the same thing. We're literally letting the putrescible fraction of the waste rot. Uh, it produces methane. If you will, the bacteria are eating the uh, putrescible fraction, which as I said earlier, is primarily the food waste, the paper, the cardboard. Um, that material is eaten by the microbes. We do it in a sealed chamber so that no gases escape, no odors escape, and uh, we can do it in 28 days instead of 20 years. And so you can see these buildings in the uh, video or the PowerPoint here and see typical digesters. Uh, I love this one from Germany that's sitting right next to a Burger King just because that emphasizes there aren't any odor problems with, with these digesters. They're not like a landfill because if any of the gas is escaping, that's the, the money escaping from the process. Sure. Picture of something from Germany. Mm -hmm. Where's the one in Tennessee or in the United States, where? Uh, the company we're working with is actually out of Germany, so that's where their, their plants are, but there are a number of people in California, Oregon, Washington, and in the Northeast that, that do have digesters of different brands. There's like 14 different brands of digesters uh, currently being used in the U.S. So uh, we, we can do a tour of U.S.-based digesters at some point if, if the committee would like to. So that's happening in the United States right now? Yes. And they're making the same final product? Yes, they're exact, making renewable natural gas. Okay, identical product. Waste Away doesn't have one at this point in time. Correct, correct. correct. And what the Waste Away process does is it can take mixed waste and make it available for digestion. Uh, what most of the projects in the U.S. right now are doing is they do source separated collection and they collect the food waste and the paper and the cardboard separately and then that's what they feed into the digester to make the uh, uh, renewable natural gas. With the waste away process, we're able to pre-treat everything where we don't have to do that. And so that, that's what's unique about the, the difference in this. The digesters that are in uh, the United States at mm -hmm. this time, are they United States companies or are they foreign companies? Well, the, the companies that own and operate them are U.S. based. The technology, some of them are U.S. technologies and some of them are European technologies because in this space, Europe is quite frankly a little bit ahead of the U.S. Well, while he's asking you questions on that, what percentage of waste is left over after going through the digester? How much? A if you after put in going 10 through the digester, we'll have about 50% of the of the SE3 will still be available for sale to the cement kiln. Or, excuse me, 50% of the incoming mass. So, um, we had 70% of the incoming mass was available for sale. Now, 50% will be available for sale, and 20% of the total incoming waste will be converted to gas. Well, what I'm asking is, the, you, you said that you're taking like food waste and mm -hmm. going through the anaerobic process. Uh, all of the SE3 will go into the digester. We, we don't have to separate it with the waste away process. Well, what I'm asking is, mm -hmm. what percent is waste that will have to go to a landfill after that process? There's not any that goes after that process. In the waste away process earlier, there's still that 10 to 12 percent that we've always sent to the landfill, and that's the rocks, the glass, uh, the materials that, that won't either combust in the case of solid fuel or make gas in the case of the uh, digestion. So the, the stuff that has no fuel benefit 
and is not recyclable, that material would still go to the landfill, but that's 10 to 12%, and that, that's been true for a number of years now. And, and I'll take time for more questions at the end, but let me jump on through some of this, or, or stop me at any point, I, I don't mind. Um, so real quick, talking about the, the city and, and where we are with them, they've kind of broken the project into to four different pieces. Um, they're not really phases because they all kind of move through construction uh, at the same time, but they've got four pieces. Uh, the first is the material management station. That's a fancy word for a transfer station. Uh, there are reasons we have to use certain language in this to get the federal government to, to pay for 25% of the whole project. And uh, so we're, we're using the word material management station, but that's literally a building where waste comes into one end and either we convert it to SE3 and renewable natural gas or you can load material into trucks and send them to a landfill somewhere else if, if you choose not to use the waste way, or as we'll talk in a minute, if waste way's not completed as quickly as we need it to be in order to uh, hit your, your January 1st, 2025 deadlines. So the other three pieces are the uh, SE3 manufacturing, that would be the traditional waste away equipment. Uh, the next piece would be the anaerobic digesters, that's the big cylinders we saw earlier in the, the pictures. And then there's some cleanup materials or cleanup equipment that cleans that natural gas so that it's to uh, pipeline quality. And um, that, that technology has been in use once again in the U.S. for over 30 years and it is well, they're both, once again, U.S. and European technologies, but it's a very proven technology. It's the same technology. Um, I'm not sure what brand they're using. I've just seen some of the, the uh, newspaper articles, but I understand Republic's putting in gas collection and uh, improving that system out at Middle Point now. So it's the same type of technology they'll be using to capture that gas and clean it up so they can sell the landfill gas. Um, as I said, the, the material management piece, the, the site and the building, it can be used as a transfer station if at some point in the future it was decided not to continue to operate waste away for some reason. And everything else, all of the technology components, uh, the city is choosing to, to pay for those using revenue bonds. Uh, so any of the risky, it's, it's really extremely low risk, but anything that's considered to have a risk would, would be uh, paid for by the revenue bonds. The only thing that the, uh, um, the local funding would be going to Republic financing would just be the site and the building. Um, and, and as I understand it, and Darren may want to speak to this a little bit later, um, but as I understand it, the, the city has offered the county a, a draft of an interlocal agreement, and under that interlocal agreement, what uh, has been uh, offered is the city and the county would work together to pay just for that transfer, let me go back, just for, for part one, the part that would be public financing, uh, split the cost of, of basically building the building, and, um, and then everything else, the city would take care of financing it. Uh, Wasteway has actually agreed to operate uh, the, the rest of the facility if, if asked to. And, um, and then in exchange for that, if at some point the county decided uh, once again they, they wanted to do something different, the city is even offered at a, you know, the north transfer site to actually go in partners on it and pay for half of it. So, you know, if, if the county works with the city at this stage, uh, they each pay for half of the building, and um, then later if you decide you don't like this arrangement, the city will basically give you your money back and let you go do something to the north. That's not exactly the way it's written, but that's kind of what it works out to. Um. <clears throat> and so the timing, um, for a couple of reasons, we're on a very tight timeline. Uh, one is, like I said, the, the Inflation Act of, of 2022 uh, uh, 
requires that projects uh, be under substantial construction by our IRS guidelines uh, by January 1st, 2025. And in order to get the, what would amount to about an $18 million or 25% of the funding for this project, uh, and it's not a loan, gentlemen, it's, it's a check. They literally write you a check and hand it to you uh, for $18 million. Um, in order to get that money, you have to be under construction substantially uh, by January 1st. And um, so that's um, one of the things that's pushing this. And then the other one, and I'm not sure where um, uh, the original concerns came from. I had heard for some time that maybe Middle Point was closing in 2026 or 2027, but um, there seems to be a push that at least to be ready for it to close by January 1st of 2025. And so if we're going to have an operating facility that can at least transfer waste by that time, uh, we've got to start construction quickly. And we're on a timeline to try to start construction, uh, let's say July of this year. And um, now there's a lot of things that have to come together in order to meet that target, but uh, uh, everyone on the team is, is dedicated to making that happen. So, so things are going to move quickly. Um, as I've, I guess I should have been using my slides here. So uh, one is, like I said, we've, we've got to have a, a, the transfer station piece needs to be operating by January 1st of 2025 in case Middle Point closes that soon. Uh, the qualified biogas property, the IRS piece of this, uh, has to be under construction by January of 2025 to get the 25% rebate. And in order to do that, we needed the project agreement and design fees to be approved, uh, as this says now. Actually, we've accomplished that when the city actually approved that on uh, December 1st of 2022, and we are already moving forward rapidly with the uh, design of the facility. Um, so as I've already said, the, the building, we're hoping to uh, bid the building in July. Uh, we expect to be able to transfer waste by January 1st of 2025 and be making RNG later that same year. Um, and and I guess I've already jumped ahead on my slide here, but you know, under the interlocal, you would be splitting the costs of the building only. Uh, the city would be responsible for everything else via the revenue bonds. And we have agreed to, to operate the facility and take any operational risks from the project. So in closing, um, we know the waste away technology works. Like I said, some of you have, have been there multiple times now and seen it in operation. Um, it's, it's been investigated and reported on by, by numerous uh, uh, third parties. It's environmentally sound. Uh, the city did an a environmental scorecard and we scored uh, almost twice as high as anyone else from an environmental point of view. Uh, something that's very important to your citizens. There's no more landfills in Rutherford County. Now we can't roll back the clock and undo Middle Point, but there won't be a need for Middle Point or a Middle Point-like facility in Rutherford County. Uh, this project does not require any imported waste. And I think that's another important point for the, the citizens. Um, at least the ones I've talked to, they're tired of Nashville and other communities bringing all their garbage to Rutherford County, and they don't want to see a project where we're continuing to bring garbage into Rutherford County for, for Nashville or any other community in Middle Tennessee. Um, as I said earlier, um, I guess uh, Commissioner P asked the question, but we'll, we'll end up with 10 to 12% of the material does go to a landfill and that's baked into the pro forma for the project. Uh, it will have to be hauled to a, a landfill, but that's going to be rocks and glass and stuff that's safe to put in a landfill that doesn't leak, that doesn't create emissions. Um, and, and we may be able to find other beneficial uses for that rocks and glass. You can use it as road fill or, or other materials. Uh, but for now, we're assuming we will have to, to pay to haul and landfill that material, but it's only 10 to 12%. And, um, and then ultimately, by combining the waste volumes, uh, the city and county ratepayers will have the lowest cost solution. Um, you know, the city does not require the county's waste to make their project work. 
Uh, they've already taken the decision. Darren has reviewed all the numbers in detail and um, uh, they have already reached the conclusion this is a financially viable project without the county waste. Without the county waste and they'll have to uh, uh, capture a little bit of commercial waste beyond what they're currently picking up, but they're going to be looking at a, a tip fee in the mid $60 per ton, which is very competitive in Middle Tennessee right now. Uh, without the county waste. If the county and city choose to work together, uh, that tip fee drops to the mid 40s. So it saves both the citizens of the city and the citizens of the county because you will be very hard pressed to find any solutions with a tip fee in the, the mid 40s. Um, in fact, communities all around recently have been bidding uh, uh, you know, waste and, and it's, you know, more like $70 is, is the going rate in Middle Tennessee and up right now. So uh, if you work together, the mid 40s is cheaper than any option I'm aware of. And uh, if the facility is fully utilized, it's possible to get that number down uh, close to $30 a ton. So, um, you know, if some of the other communities in Rutherford County, or if you're able to capture a little more of the commercial waste and fully load the facility, uh, the, the tip fees will be down around $30 a ton. Um, now those are today's numbers and we're still working, uh, you know, doing revenue bond financing. The bondholders will have a say so in the rates on those bonds. So there's a little fluctuation in these numbers, but uh, we've been extremely conservative to this point in all our assumptions. So um, I'm, I'm comfortable we'll be able to hit those numbers. Um, and with that, uh, you know, like I said earlier, and I did this presentation and uh, Commissioner Johnson was there and I'm sorry, who, who was the other commissioner, Mr. I, f I forget, there was another commissioner that visited, I'm sorry, his name escapes me, but uh, Phil Wilson. Phil Wilson, yeah. Um, and, and I saw this same presentation just before Christmas. Um, and, and you know, as I told them, you know, with the city taking the lead on this, they're really giving the county a very uh, easy way to, to solve the solid waste problems because the city is, is taking any risk that might exist, uh, giving the county a very low tip fee option. And, um, you know, by participating in, in helping with the construction of the building, uh, you know, you'll get that preferred rate and that'll be in the interlocal agreement. You can work out the details, but I'm presuming the city and the county would, would share, a, you know, whatever the lowest tip fee for each of them are is, is going to be a very low tip fee based on where the project economics come out. So um, with that, questions, comments? Thank you, Mark. Phil? Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, was profit from selling recyclables part of your pro forma? Yes, uh, it's a small part of the pro forma. I want to say it's seven or eight hundred thousand dollars in the current pro forma. So that seems to be the most uh, optimistic portion of this is selling recyclables. So, you, do you feel like that's Conservative enough. Uh, it, it's extremely conservative. The only recyclables we're we're counting on selling, as far as you know, making money, would be metals, which there's always a market. You know, for steel and aluminum, that market never goes away. And then the the uh, class one plastics, which are a high value plastic, would be the other. Everything else, we'll recycle it if local markets are available for them. But in the pro forma, we're only counting on getting money primarily from the metals. Um, the Republic that E just partnered with, was that our Republic Services? This yes. So they're buying in? Well, not in some, not in some, in some places. Yeah, they, they just invested into, into a billion the, dollars in landfill into the gas RNG. projects. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, how many tons per year? 140,000 tons per year or 400 tons per day will be the, the capacity of the plant. And so if, if Rutherford County's only processing their waste, it'd basically run half the time. And last question, so tip fees, 60 to 40 to 30, depending right. on the volume. Um, who's, t who's paying the tip fees? Is the city of Murfreesboro trucks and the county trucks paying the tip fee? 
Yep, whoever's bringing waste to the facility. So, it, you know, presumably if the city and county work together, it becomes a very simple facility to operate because it's just your trucks coming in. If we bring in commercial traffic, it gets a little more complicated because then you've got a lot more truck traffic. But, but you're going to chase your 140 tons per year, 140 140,000 tons right. per year. And, and as I understand it, the city and county collectively have about 100,000 tons. So, And how would you keep out of county trucks from coming in? If you claim it's we have enough here, if somebody gets in line, do you say, well, you're not from this county or... Well, I, I, I mean, that would be up to a city or county ordinance. I, you're going to charge them a fee, too. So, you know, if it's only city and county trucks coming, you just tell them, hey, you don't have an account here, so you can't bring waste. But uh, there would be ways to handle that. It, it certainly, this is not a facility we would recommend you allow, uh, you know, general citizens to bring trucks to. This, this would be more, you have to have an account, you have to sign a contract. So primarily it would be the city and the county bringing stuff in. Some of the local industries may want to bring waste there because they want to be zero landfill. I know working in industrial recruitment myself, that's huge in industrial recruiting right now. And um, so you'll probably have some of your local industry wants to participate, but they would sign, I presume, you'd want them to sign a contract uh, for what they're bringing in. Hey, Mark, you, you said something about in, in that description of 140,000 tons or, or 400 tons a day, you also said something right after that about the pl plant only working half half the time. The city goes it alone. Okay. They only have about 50,000 tons today. Um, and, and I think as Darren and I have worked the pro forma, we, we want to get that up to about half capacity, so we would encourage another 20,000 from, from local industries or perhaps some of the other communities in the county. Um, but, um, but in real world manufacturing operations, to be cost effective, don't you need to be running all the time? Well, that's what I'm saying. We can be competitive yeah. with a, a tip fee in the mid 60s at half capacity. If we load it completely, the tip fee drops to $30. So, so absolutely, that's what you're seeing in those prices. It's cheaper for everyone if okay. the city and county work together. Right. Um, but, but from a machinery standpoint, it's you, you flip a switch and yeah, the machine you, you start it and stop it. You okay. Know, it, it, it doesn't care. The the equipment in uh, McMinnville or Mer Morrison, we're only operating it you know eight hours a day. Right. So it's starting and stopping is not a problem. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Jump in, please, Mayor. So, in your pro forma for 140,000 tons, which would equate to today's numbers, $30 a tip, plus or minus. Right. How many hours a week of operation is that? We, we actually, we run seven days a week, and we have 16 hours of, of what we call uptime per day and then eight hours allowed for maintenance and unplanned downtime. Because when you're dealing with garbage, you're going to have shredders that jam and, and other occurrences over the course of the day. That's so exactly right, and it, which gets to my point. So is, our, is 16 hours of continuous operation in a 24-hour period built into the pr pro forma? Is that what's built into the pro forma of 140,000 tons at That's $30 a tip? Uh-huh. Was there, was there built into the pro forma um, replacement of equipment? Because obviously, they're having seen the facility, there are a tremendous number of conveyors and motors, gears, um, a lot of moving parts, and it's it's a pretty dirt, it's a pretty dirty site mm -hmm. for that equipment. Mm -hmm. Is built into that pro forma also the downtime for replacing of equipment? Uh, repairs and this kind of thing. Yes, sir. If, if you do the quick math, the 400 tons per day uh, times 350 days a year gets you to the 140,000 tons. So, so we've got some days built into the calendar that uh, in the pro forma that we could be down. And then also, not only is it built into the operating cost of the facility, 
but in the capital cost of the facility, we have a, a large inventory so that you have all of the significant spare parts on site uh, to, to kind of start off on a, a good foot, if you will. And so, and so those spare parts, motors, gears, pulleys, belts are built into the pro forma, correct? Correct. Both the operating and the capital pro formas. And the, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, you said you're working on a 350 day calendar, operational calendar, is that correct? For the pro forma, yes. For the sir. pro forma. Mm -hmm. So this is a seven day a week operation. Correct. So it would be taking trash on Sunday as well as many holidays. If if, if that works for the city and the county, we typically will size a tipping floor with a three to four day capacity. And so that way, you know, if we're running on Sunday and you're not delivering waste on Sunday, we'll have some piled up from the, the week before that we can process. In the event that the waste away facility for some reason can't operate for several days at a time or a week or two, what is the plan B for this particular facility to deal with 400 tons of trash a day that is contractually obligated to receive. Right. For this facility, if you'll remember in our original conversation, we we're talking about initially if we start receiving trash on January 1st of 2025, we're not even running the waste away equipment that soon. So it would be designed to be operated as a transfer station. We would have the hauling contracts in place. And if you think about it, We've already, and we're already talking to transportation companies that can do this. Obviously, once again, because it's a city facility, eventually it will have to be bid. But um, the, the transportation companies in normal operation would be hauling 12% of the material to the landfill. They would be hauling the fuel from uh, Murfreesboro probably to Chattanooga, depending on who wins the bid to buy the fuel. And so if we end up, for some reason, you know, we have to shut down for a week, um, we would continue, we would flip the switch and go back to operating as transfer station. The hauling company would be hauling everything to the landfill for a few days if they need to, and we would have those contracts in place with the, the landfill as, as part of the project. That would just, we're going to be <coughs> contracting for them to take 12%, so we just have a contingency that, you know, whatever three weeks a year or six weeks a year or whatever the city deems is appropriate that we can bring everything to the landfill. Thank you. Anthony. What would be your timeline for accepting trash or waste and producing the renewable natural gas? It, you know, we're saying we'll be operational as a transfer station by January 1st, 2025. Uh, on our perfect world timeline right now, we actually could be producing renewable natural gas that soon, but that's in a perfect world. So I'm saying later in the year of 2025, we'll actually be producing renewable natural gas. But uh, Darren and I have a a, a Gantt chart we're not showing anybody that says if nothing goes wrong, if all the permits are issued as quickly as possible, uh, if Griggs and Maloney does their design work, they, they've been brought on board to do some design work, not to put Ryan on the spot here, but if, if they get their drawings done in time, if the bidders get their bids back in on time and there's no weather, I mean, we all know that the delays, we've just lived through COVID, but with no delays, we could have it all up and running by January 1st, but we will definitely have the transfer station running by then and the waste away equipment and the renewable natural gas would come on board later that year. Well, that was needed information also, but I, I guess I wasn't clear. Uh, I guess I should have said, excuse me for shaking, but I'm freezing over here. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I'm speaking of is once you're in operation, you're, you're accepting the trash mm -hmm. from the city, the county, whoever. Mm -hmm. You accept it on the floor. Mm -hmm. How long does it take to produce the renewable natural gas and also, where does the trash go in the interim if it's not being just fed right in and right out? Okay, it's, it's fed right into the digesters. As I think I said during the presentation, the material stays in the digester for 28 days. So on day zero, 
We start processing material with the wasteway and filling the digester, and it will take 28 days to fill the digester. And once it's full, then we start removing material and introducing new material on a continuous basis. So from that point forward, you've got, I guess you could say you've kind of got 28 days worth of trash in the digester at all times. But uh, once, once you're full and in continuous operation, then it's just a continuous flow. So the <clears throat> trucks in today and into the digester today? Yes. If but, it was in operation today. Yeah, if it, if it were in operation today. Yeah, if it had been in operation, let's say, for 60 days and everything's up to steady state. Yeah. So, it, so it's not like a crock pot where you're not supposed to lift a lid and let the steam out. You, you, you were constantly adding new material in while it's still festering. Yeah, w without getting too deep into the technical yeah. side of it because it is a very technical piece of equipment in some ways but but yes we're we're constantly adding new material to the top and removing the the old rotten material from, from the, the bottom. bottom okay now in reality it actually gets circulated three times and i don't want to get into all the technical gotcha. side of that but right. simplistically that's what happens yeah if you would spoon feed me like i'm an infant okay okay we talked about transfer stations, mm -hmm. and now we're talking about a digestive station or a plant mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. I've got lost as to where this is and where it's located. Is it built now? Is it going to be built? Who's building it? I have, I'm lost for, between the transfer station and what happens after that. Okay. Effective January 21st, 2025. Okay. So. What the city has, has signed an agreement with Wasteaway to do is, is to build this project subject to hitting certain milestones. I mean, you know, we have to, uh, we're going to have to get, the city's going to have to get the financing. Uh, there's permits that have to be obtained. There are a number of things that have to happen, but assuming everything goes as planned, um, we will be constructing a building that will initially be used as a transfer station. And that means the garbage trucks dump material on the tipping floor and we load it onto bigger trucks and they haul it somewhere to a landfill. And then as the equipment is fully installed and operated, that same building will be holding the, the operating equipment and we'll just start running the material through the wasteway instead of using the facility as a transfer station. But at any point, as the mayor you know, correctly noted, we need a contingency plan. And, and the city's had those same questions. We've got to have a contingency, things break sometimes. So if things break for some reason, and we need to once again operate the facility as a transfer station for two weeks, then we just flip the switch and stuff goes into the trucks without going through the waste away process, and we're a transfer station for two weeks. So, so you're saying the transfer station that is proposed mm -hmm. will also be a, a, a plant that will digest Correct. the waste. Yep, it, it'll be all on the same site out on, on the Butler Drive property that the city already has. And when it leaves that facility, it'll be fuel, pellets. Correct. Mm -hmm. Where does it go from there? Uh, the renewable natural gas can either be hauled by trucks or sent directly into a pipeline, and the, the solid fuel will be going in, in trucks most likely to Chattanooga to Boozy Cement. I mean, like I said, we're gonna to have to bid that, but that's the most likely location. You mentioned permits. Mm -hmm. Who will be in charge? What's your experience with permits and state, federal, all those permits? We, that was a big question when we were interviewing companies uh, for a transfer station for the county. Mm -hmm. uh, Give us your answer on that as far as permits. You know, our expectations are to have the, the key permits in place in time to put this out to bid in July um, because we, we know you're not going to, to get the revenue bonds to finance it until the permits are approved or at least they know they will be approved. You can't put the building out to bid until all the building permits are approved. So in order to move forward on the, the timeline we're on, we're hoping to have all the significant permits in July. The long permits that are normally hard to get uh, like for the, the fuel use, uh, Boozy already has those permits in hand, so they can already use this fuel if they need to. And those air permits are kind of the, 
those are the permits you hear about that can take two or three years to get your permit sometime. Now I've got another project in California. Out there, it may take two or three years to get a permit to build the building. I mean, it's incredible some of the things we're seeing in California with permitting. But in Tennessee, we believe we can have uh, the key permits in place by the middle of this year so that we can move forward. Which the way we'll be applying for those permits? Yes, well, as part of the agreement with the city, Wasteaway and Griggs and Maloney will be working together to, to get those permits. Steve. This process, if it all goes com complete smooth and you're converting it over to renewable gas, mm -hmm. you're looking at, a, what, around $76 million? Yeah, it's about $70 million is what we've got budgeted. I think that's the last number we used, wasn't it, Darren? 65, well, yeah, and then, but we get um, 18 roughly back from the, the federal government on that. When the key's turned in the door and it's a finished product, who will it belong to? It'll belong to the city of Murfreesboro. Um, now, with the interlocal, you guys can talk about some of that, but as, as far as I'm concerned right now, I'm under contract with the city of Murfreesboro to build this facility and operate it, and if I'm only processing Murfreesboro waste, that's fine with me, so it, it would belong to the city of Murfreesboro. How will it benefit Rutherford County in sharing in the cost of the transfer station and still paying a 30 to $40 tipping fee? Well, my presumption would be that you will be getting a preferred uh, tip fee rate. Uh, I would certainly not suggest that if you're bringing commercial waste in that you give them the same rate that the city and the county are getting if you've invested in the initial facility. Um, once again, that would be something to work out in your interlocal agreement, but I would think the city and the county would expect to be paid. And you know, paying if, if you own the facility or you paying yourself, that kind of becomes a uh, accounting issue. But effectively, you're paying a tip fee. It's it's costing a tip fee. However, the the monies are transferred. And so, if you participate in the ownership of the facility, you'll get preferred rates. I'm not trying to put words in the city's mouth, and I don't think they've really talked about this. But I would presume if you don't invest you know, you would pay a slightly higher tip fee. And I don't, I don't know if that's $5 a ton or $10 a ton or what, but if I own the facility, I'd charge a little more. <laughs> but, but talk to the city about that. I really can't answer that. And I, I wouldn't want to put Mr. Gore on the spot for that tonight either. It's, um, um. It just seemed a little odd to me for us to invest into half of the transfer station and then pay a tip fee. Mm-hmm. If we build one on our old landfill and they want to use it, I wouldn't think it would be fair to charge them a tip fee. Well, they paid for half the building. Okay, well, uh, understand this tip fee is covering the operations. If you build a, like it's been talked about, a transfer station on the north, out near the uh, uh, landfill, if you build a transfer station, you're going to pay a tip fee, even as the county in the form of you're going to have to pay to make that garbage go away because you don't just deliver it to the transfer station. You've got to pay somebody to haul that and then you've got to pay a landfill somewhere to accept that waste. And so when we talk about a $30 tip fee, that's not for use of the transfer station. That's the total cost of making the garbage go away. Does that make sense? Well, it's a little better. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. In your presentation, um, it was mentioned that I think it was Busey. Was it? Uh huh. Busey uh, Cement. Yes, Busey Cement uh, Kiln did a demonstrative run, mm -hmm. and uh, basically it's to replace coal and wood. Correct. Coal. Uh, actually, I okay. think they primarily burn pet coke and ground tires at that facility, but they do use some coal. Okay, but. But during that test or the demonstrative run, mm -hmm. it's my understanding that to get the BTUs up to be able to to get the product that they needed, mm -hmm. they have to have so many BTUs. The fluff or whatever, mm -hmm. if I'm wrong, correct me, but I'll call it fluff. Yes. Uh, the fluff is not 
enough doesn't produce enough BTUs, so they had to uh, integrate. Still had to use the coal, pet coke, and ground tires. Has that changed since then? Because I know in what I read, it also said that that was being worked on to reduce the amount integrated in. Yeah, you're probably misunderstanding perhaps a little bit of, of what you read or maybe it was misstated in what you've read. Um, the BTU content of SE3 is around 9,000 BTUs per pound, which is similar to soft brown coal, which is what most cement kilns burn. So we are very similar to the uh, BTU content of coal. The reason they were co-firing our material is because we could not produce enough material. They, they burn, I forget what, Mike, can you help me? Is it 1,600 tons a day or something? It's a huge amount of fuel. And you know we were only testing a few hundred tons because you know it's expensive to haul it all down there for the test. So, um, uh, so they were co-firing coal just to be sure everything worked. But, um, right. but they could burn 100% SE3 if if they chose to. But to be clear and fair to you, mm -hmm. the reason you couldn't produce enough material. It wasn't that you couldn't produce it. You just didn't take enough down there. Correct. Because yeah. of the cost and all, and I understand that. Yeah. But I didn't want to be unfair to you and make <laughs> make it look different. Uh, yeah. No, absolutely. And and the important thing is they burned enough of the fuel in their plant that they're now willing to sign contracts, long-term contracts, to accept that fuel and use that fuel at the plant. So, you know, we negotiated with them in advance and said, you know, how much fuel do you need to burn to be comfortable buying the fuel on long-term contract? And they came up with the volume of fuel we tested. So, um, yeah, that's, they're, they're big boys. They're ready to sign a contract. And so I assume they know how much they needed to test to, to understand their facility. Mark, the mayor has a question back here. Okay. Sorry, we were having a, <laughs> a sidebar up here. Mark, um, in the pro forma, with the $30, let's say we're going to, let's say you're going to do the 140,000 tons at $30 a, a tip per ton. In that pro forma, what portion of the pro forma, of the performance of the pro forma, pro forma is the sale of the byproduct as an RNG? Because there's a, that's, that produces revenue for the project, as well as the tip fees produces revenue for the project. Because this is an industrial bond, and an industrial bond is paid back from the revenues generated by the facility. Correct. Mm -hmm. So you've got two income streams. Correct. Uh, actually, there are four income streams, but those are the by okay. far the two largest. Even even better. <laughs> so it, it just. I'm going to borrow a phrase from Dr. Phillips back here. Speak to me as a child. Tell me what the four income streams are, please. The, the four income streams, the smallest is the recycled materials, okay. the aluminum, the steel. Right. Uh, that, that's, a that's, a that's a commodity, and, commodity yeah. and that will vary, and we don't care about that right now. Real small number I in got the you. grand scheme of things. Uh, the largest one is the renewable natural gas, and it's not because of the value of the gas. It's because the federal government pays us much more than regular natural gas would be worth. In fact, they'll pay 10 times as much for renewable natural gas as you can sell conventional natural gas out of the ground. But they're not doing that currently, are they? They are currently. They are doing that currently. Yes. They, okay. They have been doing that for some time, but they've changed the rules in the past few months to make it easier to qualify. Okay, and on that RNG that's, mm -hmm. that, that we're producing, what percentage of the income stream is from the RNG in your pro forma? Aaron, can you help me with that on this project? It's... No, I would appreciate that. Of course, you and I <laughs> have already discussed that, so I'm getting I'm getting ahead of myself. So essentially, then the uh, tip fees would be approximately 20, 25, or 30 percent, right? And then the third, the fourth category would be solid fuel sales to the cement kiln. Okay, 
Yeah. And once again, that's a relatively small number as well. In fact, and Darren helped me, but I think we've got it set at zero right now because we're figuring by the time we haul it down there and we have to dry the digestate to make it back into fuel, we're, we're kind of discounting that because Darren and I have been, and, and the rest of the team working on it, we've been extremely conservative in our numbers because if we build this thing and it works better than we promised, everybody's happy. If it doesn't meet the numbers we're saying, then everybody's mad. And I, I just live, you know, an hour from here, so I, I want everybody to be happy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, Robert. Yeah, I, actually, most of my questions have been asked. I appreciate that. And one is the uh, performer of the technology and the financial end. I'd like to see if they're available to us, mm -hmm. uh, the actual studies that Murfreesboro did mm -hmm. and the results of that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the other things, and this is from a long time back, I, I understand you were doing this. You see, I forget the name of the company. Yeah, Boozy. Mm -hmm. At one time, there was some question about your fuel being harmful to boilers. Has that been debunked or tell me, tell me, fill me in on that? You know, that's a statement I've heard floating around the rumor mill for, for some time. Um, you know, all the way back to 2018, we were successfully using this fuel in full-scale power plants and they weren't concerned about it. Um, Hearst Boiler is one of the boiler companies we're working with and they will sell you a new boiler and give you a written warranty that you can use this fuel in their boiler and it will not cause any performance degradation or equipment problems. There have been problems in years gone by with conventional refuse-derived fuel because of the chlorine content, it can damage the boilers. But the waste away process has always taken care of that problem. And that's part of how we got the EPA certification. They will not certify refuse derived fuel unless you maintain low chlorine numbers, both for the protection of the boilers and for the emissions that might be produced by the equipment. So that has never been a concern for waste away. And we, we've got all kinds of studies and all kinds of manufacturers and power companies and cement kilns and all of these guys are a lot smarter and have a lot more engineers on staff than I do and they're ready to sign contracts and buy the fuel so they wouldn't do so if it was going to damage their equipment. Okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned a minute ago part of the revenue streams was the natural gas which was you said the biggest revenue stream Correct. stream mm -hmm. and that's because the federal government is mm -hmm. subsidizing it mm -hmm. how long is the federal government going to subsidize this gas this gonna is going to do it the, 10 years and then cut it off or what this is the same uh, law that is used to support the ethanol industry today. So if they shut it off, they have to shut down the ethanol industry. And so you end up with one of those rare situations in Congress. You have the farm lobby that's strongly supported by one party. You have the environmental lobby that's strongly supported by the other party. And both of them are pushing their uh, legislators to strongly support this project. So the chance, and it's, it's a perpetual project. It goes on forever unless Congress and the president can agree to kill it. So I, I don't see it ever going away. But the important thing, and I'd have to look at, I've got so many of these projects right now because with the Inflation Reduction Act, everybody wants a waste away. So all the numbers kind of get jumbled in my head which is why I've had to refer to Darren a few times on the Performa for this project. But uh, uh, most of these projects, we're able to pay off the CapEx in, in pretty short windows of time. So as long as the, uh, you know, it's around for even four or five years, we can get the project paid for. And then from that point forward, if they did end the subsidies, uh, you know, we've already got the project paid for, so we're not losing sleep over it. now. You know, the tip fees are going to go up if the subsidies go away, but it's still going to be cheaper than any alternative you're going to have, in, including sending it to another landfill somewhere else. Okay, like I said, I've got a list. Most of them were answered, but I, I've got a long no, list. No, that's here. fine. But uh, one thing that, and this to me is a game stopper for mm -hmm. me. I've asked you this three times, and you've told me three times. <laughs> Uh, I'll ask it for four. Maybe it's a fifth time. I think I've seen your program <laughs> that many times. 
A couple of things that bother me about your company, mm -hmm. and, and I think y'all are nice people. Mm -hmm. You know, I believe what you're telling me, mm -hmm. but I, it bothers me that Warren County has never put a facility in in there. I mean, that's where you're from. Why have they never jumped on this opportunity? That's that's one question. Okay. Uh, well, we'll go ahead and let you. Okay. Let you. Uh, you know, we did process all of Warren County's waste for five years. Uh, and, and proved we could do so successfully. At the time, we were making compost and we didn't have the renewable natural gas and we didn't have the SC3 available to sell. So for every ton that I was processing at, uh, I think it was $37 back at the time, uh, I was losing about $15 a ton doing so. And uh, so we decided this is, I mean, we're a for-profit business. We decided that's not a good uh, business plan for Waste Away to process waste and, and lose money on every ton. Uh, now that we can sell renewable natural gas and SE3, those numbers have changed. The problem today in, in Warren County is it's such a small county, we just don't have enough waste. You know, as, as I said earlier, we kind of need that 50 to 75,000 tons. And in Warren County, we don't have that much waste. We'd have to get three or four counties to all agree to work together. And um, I mean, it's hard enough to get a city and a county to agree to work together, much less three or four counties, plus all the cities that might be part of it. Well, what about your facility in Aruba? I mean, I, I want to get all these questions yeah. I've got. You know, the facility in Aruba, we built it back, uh, I think it started in operation in 2009, if I remember correctly, and, uh, you know, operated for, for three years, highly successful. Uh, but their plan was to build a power plant, and the government changed parties, and the new government didn't like the deal they had to build the power plant, so they changed the rules, and the group that was going to build the party, the power plant walked away, and they've never been able to come up with financing to build the power plant since. And uh, in fact, it's interesting you would mention Aruba. We literally got a phone call this morning from Aruba wanting us for the fourth time to come back down and certify that the plant was still operational because they think they have a plan to get somebody to invest in the power plant. So they've actually paid us on three different occasions to go down and, and be sure that plant could be operated and help them get it up and going again. But every time they had the Chinese were going to finance it one time, the, the Dutch were originally going to finance it and they got into a squabble with them. Uh, their central bank is only good for about $9 million, so they can't finance it themselves anyway. So they've, they've got to have an outside investor that wants to build a power plant on the island. Two more questions and I'll be done. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, you said this facility was going to be 70 million. I think 65 minus 18 that the federal government's going to give you back or right, whatever. Right. Is that including the uh, natural gas uh, that just for the uh, process you do right now? They, they will only give us that that 25.5 percent grant if the facility is producing, producing renewable natural gas. So if there's not renewable natural gas in the project, then there is no federal subsidy. So we, we have to make gas in order to get the subsidy. To continue on that same question, since mm -hmm. it'll look like three. No, that's uh, fine. Your cost of operation for, uh -huh. what are you estimating your ongoing cost of operation to be year over year? Uh, and I'm going to be sorry unless Darren can help me answer that one. Like I said, I've got too many of these projects in my head right now. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah, that, well, we'll, like we'll said, get I, you that info or, well, or the city will. Understand, you know, Waste Away is under contract with the city, so the county and the city need to be talking a little more if, if there's some information. There's not really waste away's role to be a middleman in that, but I'll, I'll help you with any info I can provide. Well, and here's the last thing, and mm -hmm. I've asked you this already, so I probably know the answer, but uh, I've asked you about reclaiming our landfill. If mm -hmm. we ever decided to dig into that, you've mm -hmm. told me no multiple times. Yep. Um, 
Now, one of the biggest problems I've got with your company is that. Mm -hmm. uh, I know other facilities that will mm -hmm. and do it. They make a similar product. They sell their fuel to cement companies. You know, they're basically doing what you do. And we, uh, like you pointed out, we can go get a aerobic digester and make methane or turn methane into uh, natural gas as well as you can. Mm -hmm. So my question is if, and I'm not saying that's what we're going to do, but if we needed to go in to, to take that old landfill out for any reason, would y'all be willing to take the products out of that and use them to turn it into fuel or natural gas or whatever we could do? You know, Commissioner Pillion, we've had that conversation a few times, and I'm going to change my answer a little bit this time. Um, and purely because I, I saw one of the, uh, I guess it wasn't a contract, but maybe a proposal that one of the other companies offered during the RFIs or RFPs or one of these things. And their proposal uh, it was that they, or someone would pay the cost of digging the material up, they would deliver it to their facility, they would charge a tip fee for all the material delivered to their facility, and whatever was not processable material, they would hand it back to the county and it was your responsibility to dispose of it. And yes, I would sign that contract because there's very little of that material that's going to be processable, and so you're just going to be paying my facility, whether it's $30 or $40 or $60 a ton, and getting very little value out of it. So, you know, if that's what, that's the contract I've seen some of my competitors offer you that really gave you very little value. The portion of that material that can be converted to fuel, yes, we could process it for you, but there's very little of the material in a landfill of that age that is going to have any fuel value at this point. It, a lot of it's dirt. And, and dirt doesn't have any fuel value. And you will not successfully put the material in an old landfill into a digester either. That's, it, it just won't work. Um, so, I, you know, I wish I had a better answer, so but that's just that. the fact. You, you put some uh, material from an old landfill into your digesters and Pardon? tried that? You tried that? No, I've, but um, I'm depending on the University of Wisconsin uh, on uh, multiple digester manufacturers, and, and they all tell me exactly the same thing. And, and any of the, the literature, you have what's called a bell curve on methane production, even in a landfill, and it, it starts producing methane effectively in about three years after it's buried, and it produces methane for about 10 years, and then it tails off on the back end of the bell curve. And, you know, the material at the old landfill is more than 10 years old so there's just not a lot of methane production left in that material today there's just not a lot of fuel value there's there's a lot of dirt there and contaminated well, dirt at that <laughs> well depending on how contaminated the dirt might be the yep. dirt's worth quite a bit of money yeah but uh also there's recyclables i mean i've looked at studies where landfills have been reclaimed and, you know, they say as much as 30% sometimes, in some cases, has been reusable. In some so, cases, it is possible to recycle that material. Uh, we could certainly help. It, the most efficient way to do that is not going to be to pay a tip fee to run that through a waste away facility. Uh, you can get people that will help you reclaim landfills and capture those recyclables. And if you want help, you know, marketing those recyclables alongside the recyclables that Waste Away is selling, we'd be glad to work with you on that. So we'll be glad to work with you in any way we can. I just don't want to charge the county for something that's going to be much more expensive when there are better ways to deal with that material. Well, let me assure you, we won't let you. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, All right, Mark, I got one, one last question, okay. then, then we'll wrap it up. One thing, you, you talked about recyclables, that metals and the class one plastics that you would pull out. Mm -hmm. You didn't mention anything about cardboard. Mm -hmm. One of the topics we're gonna to talk about tonight is cardboard. Mm -hmm. Do you need cardboard as part of the fuel source and the breakdown into methane? Is that a good thing to have in your it's, treatment train or it, not? It, it is a good thing to have in the, the fuel, but it's not essential. Everything we do at Waste Away, we never want to step on the toes of any other recycling that may be going on in the community. Okay. 
So if you want to capture the cardboard separately, go for so it. So it, it, you, you, um, you would tell Darren that you do not have to have paper or cardboard for your fuel to be a, the, the premium fuel that you desire does not have correct. to have a cardboard content. Correct. That's what I needed to know. Yep. Thank you. Any last questions? Anthony, let's make it fast. <laughs> now, we're in the process of looking at building a transfer station. Mm -hmm. and it's my understanding that in our transfer station we'll dump and bail mm -hmm. and then move it somewhere else mm -hmm. yet to be discovered. <laughs> um, do you have a problem, does your process have a problem receiving bailed material versus loose? Because what I saw in your, your uh, well on our tour of mm -hmm. your facilities, uh, everything was loose. Uh, we, we have no problem processing bailed material, but I fail to understand why you would build a facility in Rutherford County, pay the cost of bailing it, pay a separate haul bill across the county, and, and then process it. I mean, yes, we could process the material, but it's going to end up costing you an extra 20 or $30 a ton by the time you pay for a separate transfer station and the cost of operating the baler and everything else. Maybe more than that. I'm, I'm just throwing a number out there. That's in fact, why it I would was be asking. more than that. That's why I was asking, because we're going to presumably have the cost of the bail machinery yeah uh, and from what I'm hearing is you won't be up and running probably I may be wrong but maybe a year after we would already start bailing so maybe we need to bail for a year and ship it somewhere else until you get up and running I could see that but I don't know what the cost of the bailing but you know and all that's gonna cost us so. well and and you know, I'm not aware of any need to start transferring material before January 1st of 2025, and we will be able to transfer material uh, starting on that date. So, you know, yes, we'll, we'll work with the county any way you need us to with that, but I would say let's take a long look at it because it looks like you're spending maybe doubling the cost of your waste disposal by doing that. So I've, I'd be careful before I did that. All right, Steve, you're the last one. Early in your presentation, you said you kept extra spare parts, pulleys, belts, all this. Mm -hmm. That's day-to-day -day wear, maintenance part. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to put any guesstimate on the life span, the lifespan mm -hmm. of this entire facility before it would have to be redone? You know, for investment purposes, we count on a 30-year lifespan of the uh, plant and equipment. And uh, so that's what the investors are, are looking at is, is 30 years. Uh, in reality, because of the high level of maintenance that, that's required, and, and Mayor Carr correctly noted earlier, this is intensive duty equipment. It does require a lot of maintenance because it's dealing with garbage. And we all know you end up with you know everything from tractor transmissions to cinder blocks to whatever in the garbage, even though it may not be supposed to be there. So yes, because of the, the maintenance it's constantly done on it. Um, basically, all the moving parts, if you look at an average, are replaced on an average of about nine years. So all the moving parts are effectively new every nine years anyway. So, you know, it would not shock me at all if this building and facility continued to operate for 40, 50 years. But from an investor's standpoint and what the due diligence engineers have, have looked at is a 30-year life facility is what they're willing to, to stand behind based on third-party investigations. So we're we're talking about like a two and a half million dollar expense a year for 30 years for the entire facility more or less. Um, I'm not sure where you're getting the two and a half million from. 30 years and oh for the million, okay yeah yeah right correct. Roughly two and a half mm -hmm. million. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Darren, do you have any closing remarks or anything you want to <laughs> add? Okay, all right. <laughs> That's all right. You're perfectly welcome to do that. All right, Mark, thank you. And Mike, thank you very much for attending. Yeah, yeah take, we'll take five. Um, and we will probably have you back again at some point in time. But <laughs> thank you for what you do, and uh, congratulations on uh, 
on this new opportunity with the uh, renewable natural gas. Well, and, and you know, invite us when you will. We, we're yep. not that far away. We'll be glad to come back. Let me just encourage you, if this is something you're really interested in, faster decisions are better than slow ones right. because I personally would love to see the county involved. I mean, Ryan's already scheduling the, the, plan, the resource planning and the master planning for this facility. If the county wants to get involved, it would be better to have Bishop or some of the other county people sitting in those meetings yeah. and participating with that planning. So if, if you're interested, I'd encourage you to move sooner rather yeah. than later. We'll, we'll get the two mayors together yeah. quickly. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll take we'll take a quick couple of minutes and then we'll uh, reconvene. And uh, just and I, my apologies to codes, planning, and engineering. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring Nick up and we're gonna talk about the uh, letter of intent with Pratt really quickly, so Nick can go home to his family and then we'll get back to regular schedule. So, really quickly, a couple of minutes. And again, this is the uh, Rutherford County Public Works Planning Committee of uh, Tuesday, January third, twenty twenty three. Uh, uh, jumping the agenda just a little bit, I'm going to uh, uh, bring something back to light, which is the Pratt Recycling um, Letter of Intent. This is something that we actually discussed back in August. This committee did, uh, for those of you who are, are new, this uh, failed at this committee went to full commission, was brought up at full commission from the floor, passed at full commission. Then we were tasked to uh, the two attorneys, uh, our county attorney and the attorneys for Pratt to review and, and redline, make corrections, uh, the letter of intent. And then we were tasked then to uh, make a decision as to whether we are going to go forward and then report back to full commission. Uh, since that time, obviously, we have had a new uh, uh, change of command uh, with the uh, new mayor and new some new commissioners. Uh, so that brings us to, to this point. Uh, Nick Christensen is here. If we need him to discuss the, the letter of intent that is on your SharePoint, and uh, let me just tell you in brief that uh, if you'll recall that part of that uh, letter of intent was to use the Sanger Road property, uh, which has the rail spur, and we were going to uh, do a long-term lease on that for you know minimal dollars, nominal, yeah. Uh, the new administration, uh, has had um, some uh, concern about that valuable piece of property uh, being tied up in a lease for that amount of time. Uh, many, me included, thought that that was uh, uh, too valuable a real estate to be to be doled out like that. But regardless, the fact that we are building a new transfer station now to me makes more sense for uh, a company like Pratt to partner with us at the new transfer station facility, whether it is being part of the building or using some of the property we have next door or on site uh, to, to build uh, either with us or they can build their own and we can supply property, uh, a cardboard recycling or handling facility. So that's what we need to do, talk about tonight, is A, uh, decide on this letter of intent, whether we uh, pursue, we tear it up and invite them to sit down again and talk about uh, property at the uh, transfer station, which was never part of the discussion because that has uh, happened since uh, our last meeting. So here we are and that's, what we need to chat about tonight. So uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure what good it would do to, to go through the letter of intent, mainly because we, the county, uh, ha have no desire to consider the Sanger Road property as part of the deal. Uh, 
Uh, so let's open that up for discussion if you'd like, and we'll continue on. I have got several questions about it. That's why I asked yes, sir. You know, Nick to talk to us. Uh, and I understand the mayor's opinion on this, and actually I share most of that. Uh, I don't have a problem using that facility, but the problem I've got is the way this contract was written is we'll lease it to them, that, and at the end of that time, then we'd have to buy buildings that they built on our property. Well, that's, that's a no-go for me, just that by itself. And I also had questions with the amount of money that they were wanting to charge us to move this uh, material around, and I wasn't happy with that. You know, I brought this back up on the floor, and the, the com full commission voted to do this and look at this contract. And I think most of them, like me, have questions about the contract. I mean, I do, I still don't uh, like what I see, personally, uh, mainly because of the the cost of the buildings at the end of the 30 years. You know, I think it's ridiculous that I'm gonna let somebody build something on my property and then I'm gonna have to pay for it at the end of it. Uh, I don't think so, or at least not for me. That's my opinion. Okay. And two, uh, but <laughs> what I wonder is, have we had anybody, I know our attorneys have looked at that, maybe Nick can elaborate, but you know, we didn't actually sit down with them and say, hey, here's a counter offer, or how, how about doing this at our other facility? And that's the problem that I've, I've got with the way we're looking at this contract here. You know, I'd like to look at it in good faith that, hey, you know, these are uh, uh, somebody that's viable way to take care of part of our waste stream. Chairman, uh uh, you know, the old saying, it takes two to tango. Uh, to my knowledge, Pratt has not reached out to the new mayor to have any kind of discussion on this letter of intent or any business discussion in terms of what they may do for us. So you, you chime in and clarify that. Um, I have not heard from Pratt in the, since September 1. Um, I suspect that was because, and this is um, um, supposition. I mean, it's just an inference because the, f uh, the the economy got soft and recyclables got really, really soft, especially cardboard. Um, Bishop Wagner can tell you that at one time we were notified that um, our cardboard, um, where we were taking our cardboard, was no longer going to take it uh, because they had a warehouse full of it. And this is a commodity, the commodity based on the economy that just kind of fell apart. And so I wasn't surprised, uh, Commissioner P, that I didn't get contacted. Um, it was kind of, it's, it was somewhat of a relief to me, to be honest with you, because the whole LOI, the letter of intent, um, revolved around the single road project, or excuse, excuse me, the single road property. And um, that railroad spur, gentlemen, is extremely valuable. Uh, I talked to the chamber, our local chamber of commerce and they contacted TVA. I just wanted to know quantifiably what that property might be worth to Rutherford County because of that railroad spur. Uh, the term that was uh, used to describe that particular piece of property was that it was a unicorn. And that means um, in layman's language, it's, it's a very valuable and unique piece of property uh, because of the railroad spur, because railroad spurs are very difficult to construct and get approved by because the railroad line doesn't like to do that. And so that railroad spur and that 19 acres was extremely valuable. Uh, also talking to waste management, I found out that for processing recyclables or waste, a railroad spur has no value unless you're going to move by rail your recyclables or waste at least 350 miles and waste management told me directly that scenario does not exist for Murfreesboro. You just, you will not ship your uh, waste or your recyclables 350 miles by rail. It takes too much time and too much effort and too much money to literally to build a train, which is, it's, which is a very tedious process, just take too much effort for it to be financially feasible for the county. So here we have this valuable piece of property with a spur 
and we have a situation where it's being tremendously underutilized if it, where we're going to be a recyclable recycling facility there. And so I just thought maybe it was in the financial best interest of the county to maybe look at other alternatives uses for that particular site. Having said that, I think it's extremely important, and I've said this over and over again, it bear, bears repeating. The long-term, indeed, the medium-term goal of our transfer station is to divert as much waste away from a landfill as possible. That means recycling, means composting, all these technologies. That is the goal. The goal isn't to transfer our waste to another landfill. That's that, the transfer station, is to alleviate what I believe is a pending crisis if the landfill closes at middle point in two, two and a half years. And so we have that situation we're trying to resolve with a transfer station, but the transfer station then allows us to move our waste to a waste away facility if we want to, or to another type of facility. It gives us, gives us options. So uh, the LOI, the letter of intent with Pratt, number one, they, they have not contacted me directly. I have not heard from them. If they've called my office, I'm unaware of it. Uh, number two, the single road property is uh, underutilized and highly valued for that application. And number three, uh, what Commissioner, excuse me, Chairman Cush said is absolutely correct. If we're going to partner with Pratt, and I'm quite open to the idea, if we're going to partner with Pratt, then it seems to me we're building a campus-like facility at Landfield Road with the transfer station. Commissioner, you've talked about a dirty MRF. We've talked about a number of things on that property where we've got the room and the already zoning and we can permit by rule out there. So it just makes more sense if we were to partner with Pratt that we would choose another location. Thank you. So my preference, you, uh, you, here's, here's the six of you. My preference would be we, uh, we dissolve or we eliminate any discussion. No, that's not true. My suggestion is we take no action on the letter of intent. Uh, we send that uh, request to the full commission. And in the meantime, we reach out to Pratt and say, look, we're building a transfer station. If you have any interest on putting a facility or incorporating a facility at our transfer station and handle your cardboard, our cardboard there, uh, and make it uh, financially uh, profitable for both of us, then let's sit down and talk. That would require a brand new RFI, or, or not RFI, but a letter of intent and a contract at some point. But this one is going nowhere with us. So that would be my suggestion. I have a question on your comments you just made. Yeah. Having the Pratt facility on our landfill road. Yes, sir. Do you think Pratt is going to come and build a facility to do our cardboard and our cardboard alone? Th these are things we wouldn't know until we sit down at, at the table and talked about. I'm not, I'm not saying we have to have them. I'm just saying, look, here's an opportunity. You, we, we all liked your thoughts several months ago. We thought you were one of the two that we wanted to do business with. Um, can you do it on this site? Or, you know, they also said, it, we need your board so bad, and this is such a great part of Middle Tennessee that they were going to build their own facility. You remember them saying that? They told us they were coming here regardless, regardless. they got the Singer property or not. My point being, we've, we're hoping that what we've got out there is fading in the in the future letting somebody like that build a facility on our property you know they're going to have to have other trash rather than bring it to the singer site they'll bring it from there and 90 percent of it's coming out of metro they're they're recyclables i've been corrected on the trash situation before and look like we're kind of biting our nose off spite our face if we're trying to slow trash coming into this county and maybe entertaining the idea of a facility being built on our own property to let other trash from other counties come into our county. Steve, don't get me wrong. I, I don't want other trash coming into our county. 
My recollection of their conversation was taking our cardboard. I, I don't. I, I don't want them to put a facility on our land or really anywhere else where they have to bring in 5, 10, 12, 20 other counties of trash and process it here. I don't, I don't want that. But in, until we sit down and talk to them and find out for sure if that's what they have to have to feed that monkey, I, I don't know. But have they? Okay. Okay. Uh, my understanding was that they weren't going to bring cardboard in from outside what they were doing the the cardboard that i think that gives that perception is i think there's places like nissan that may be getting their car they're getting their cardboard now and they're taking it to nashville to process it or ship it from there but instead of taking it to nashville they would have taken it to this other facility here it's still cardboard originating yeah. hardwood maybe not originated here but it was used at one of our manufacturing facilities went to Davidson instead of going to Davidson it would stay in our county that's that was my understanding I, I don't think I'm wrong but that's the way I, Mr. I, Mr. I Chairman, understood it yes sir um, I, I think if, if with the committee's approval I'll get I'll ask Bishop to contact Pratt and what we'll do is uh, I'm not the mayor's office is not opposed to Pratt and we're certainly not opposed to recycling. We are, we are absolutely, in, that's, that's the future if we're gonna divert waste. I think we all agree on that. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the idea that we're under the guise of recycling or not recycling, bringing waste into our county. I think the county's tolerance for that is about over. Well, it's over for me. I think it's, it's over, been over from Walter Hill for a long time. And I think it's about over for everybody else. And so what I would suggest, Mr. Chairman, is that uh, I get Bishop to call Pratt and I just sit down and find out exactly what we have in mind for 2023 and I'll bring that report back to this committee and then we can have that discussion and then we can, if, if it, uh, it's acceptable, we want to have Pratt come back and speak to this committee and we can ask them those questions directly because I certainly haven't had a conversation so I don't know what's going on if, or to what degree, if anything's changed. So if that's acceptable to you, Mr. Chairman of the committee, that's exactly what we'll do. That would be fine with me. In, in the meantime, though, I would like to have a motion to not act on this current LOI, and then we'll start fresh with them. I'll make, I'll make that motion. Like I said, the reason I brought that up at the full commission is we needed to look at what the possibilities are and that's what we're doing here, so yep. I, I do make that motion. Yeah. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on that? Will that motion and second rescind everything that the county commission did back during the summer when we did all the work with Pratt? Uh, will it just, uh, all, of, all of that stuff? I'm just asking. I'm, I'm not I'm sure what. I'm not saying I'm opposed to it or anything, but no. wh what we did back in August by signing a contract or wanting to sign a contract oh. with Pratt. Is this motion eliminating all of that? Jeff, what, Jeff, what, what the full commission did was put the power back to this committee to review the letter of intent and us to decide whether it was good or bad and f we would have the final decision. We then send our next month, this month, we send that decision back to uh, the full commission that we have acted and our action would be to uh, uh, cancel the letter of intent and in my public works report for the next meeting would be we were, we we're gonna continue a discussion with Pratt on other options. So basically we start back all over again. We start back fresh. We're, that, take, we're taking the Singer Road property and the lease and all that other stuff out of the equation. That was my question. This motion will start us back where we were this past summer. E yes, and it fulfills, it fulfills the requirement that full commission put back on us. Thank, thank you. Okay. The letter of intent was never signed, correct? That's correct. It was never signed. Yeah. I may be wrong, but it was my understanding that the county commission put out the letter of intent or had us 
this committee put out the letter intent and it came back redlined it never was addressed with this committee and sent back to the commission so so my motion was for discussion and i was going to that's what i was going to bring up is that it was my understanding that the county commission voted to do the letter of intent and then it was redlined and i know it was redlined and came back but it wasn't presented to this committee until tonight well it was it was sent to us but it wasn't right discussed right and and what we're saying is what i'm saying is there's really no need to go over this red line or green lined letter of intent because a none of, none of it's been signed it's still got Ketron's name on it because we are not gonna we because it still has the singer property language in there it, it's a it that's a dead deal to us so there's no need for us to discuss it because we're pulling we're pulling out of the letter of intent because we are not going to negotiate anything on the singer road property and, and i'm in agreement with that but i was with commissioner phillips also in in my way of thinking i'm still not convinced that's not the way it was it went to commission commission voted for this committee to put this out and then it was red line so to me it should i would rather see it go back to the commission as us saying that our suggestion is to not do this i think that's what we're saying well right? no we're saying we're just going to do it tonight and it's not going back to the commission no the the motion would be to go back to the commission and one thing let me if it's okay yeah, mr yeah. chairman reason i hadn't asked and exactly what you're saying is we, we got this contract back and where he has worked on it i went over and spent some time with nick and sat down and went over the contract and and the things that bothered me on the front end of the contract with the red lines are still bothering me today and that's that's why i suggested you know that we send it back and say hey my personal opinion is I don't like this contract and I'm not willing to go into it that's my personal opinion and, and that's basically what my motions saying I, I'm, a, I'm not happy with the contract now yes I'd like to continue working with Pratt some way and I think we've already agreed that we're going to do that but that's that's my take on this Anthony I, I you know otherwise I'd have had Nick up here saying hey explain this to me what's this line mean and I've already done that so that's that's why I feel better about making that motion so, so let's clarify so the motion is to send the letter of intent <coughs> back to the full commission with the action that we that the Public Works Committee is taking no action on the letter of intent so it's it's dead in the water right I agree with that right okay is that I, th I think that's the intent of it yeah okay and, and, but it's, it's still up to the full commission to make a decision you know if there's 11 people say hey yeah i like this you know so be it okay all right so we have that motion and we have a second so all those in favor any opposed all right that motion carries all right thank you thank you y'all all right tanya are you still here sorry baby I feel I feel bad for, I feel bad for you, but business. Yeah, my name is Mark, and I'm from business, Wistaway. Yes, business That's is when business. I was going. But look at what all you've learned tonight. I know, right? Hi, everybody. Happy New Year. Um, I'm going to make this real quick. Uh, today was the first day back for Christmas vacation. It was also um, first day of the month. And it happened to fall on the night the public works meeting. So I don't have an annual report for you. I just have a monthly report for December. I'll work on an annual report for uh, 2022 over the next couple of weeks. So um, month of December, uh, building codes issued 228 permits total. 54 of those were single family dwellings. Um, as opposed to the previous month, which was 
68, and this time last year was 65. So we're down a little bit from this time last year and also from this time last month. Uh, does anybody have any questions on building permits? Before I move on to SFT and development tax. Yeah. Go ahead and move on. So development tax, uh, we collected 108750 this month and school facilities tax was 404112 and 50 cents. Um, our cumulative for the year for both is $2,337,389.50. This time last year, even with our numbers down this year, this time last year we were at the exact same number. We were at $2,351,054.70. So that was a difference of about $14,000. But our building permits are down significantly this year, but it's because our uh, school facilities tax, uh, we're collecting more per unit than we were with the development tax this time last year. Anybody have any questions on that? Um, school facilities tax, by the way, our uh, average square foot this uh, month of December for a single family dwelling was 2,368 square feet, and the average square foot for a townhome was 1,608 square feet. 1,608, yeah. And zoning enforcement, we had 87 inspections. What were those mainly? Um, it looks like um, uh, reinspections, open storage, uh, signs. Signs, yeah. Yeah. Any any questions on those reports? We will need approval before we go to Tiny House. Motion to approve. And a second from Joshua. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Tanya, continue. Okay. So following the full uh, Board of Commissioners approval on the um, modification of the uh, zoning ordinance where it applies to tiny houses, uh, that would require us to adopt Appendix Q of the 2018 International Residential Code where it applies to tiny houses. This appendix gives us the ability to, or it allows um, a little bit of uh, allowances where it applies to ceiling height, um, a loft area for a bedroom, ladder access to that loft area, ex egress from that loft area, uh, things specific to a tiny home. It allows us to um, permit those in the code where they no wouldn't normally be permitted. So um, I would like to push that to the full county commission if that's okay, the adoption of that to coincide with the changes of the um, zoning ordinance. Does anybody have any questions, by the way, on yeah, appendix? Q? Just a quick follow-up. Surrounding counties that are contiguous to Davison County, are, are they developing a, a, a similar ordinance for tiny homes? So when we looked at this, Williamson County doesn't have one. Um, a pen, uh, tiny houses are uh, more prevalent in rural uh, counties. The reason we kind of started talking about it, uh, Doug and I, is because we had a lot of uh, a lot of requests over the last couple of years. We've got a lot of telephone calls, a lot of um, inquiries into it, and we just felt we've talked about it for a couple of years, and we just felt like it was time to bring it to your bring it to the board of commissioners. So, what's your request? <laughs> to adopt to take the adoption of Appendix Q and add it to the adoption of the 2018 International Residential Code. The full commission will need to approve that. Correct. Move to approve, Mr. Chairman, and send to the full commission. We have a second. All those in favor? Uh, Anthony, Anthony. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Uh, Tanya, the, 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 that IRC code is dated 2018. How, how do they do those every five years, 10 years? So we, we adopt a code. We have to stay within seven years of the state. Um, the state code. Currently, they are still under the 2012. They are going to adopt the 2018, but it's taken them the last 
two years. They've got a whole lot more red tape and stuff than we do. So when they do adopt the 2018, we'll be, we'll be in sync for a long, long time. We won't have to adopt any codes for quite some time unless it becomes necessary, unless you guys feel it becomes necessary. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sorry for your wait. Nope. All right. Doug, did Mike, Mike deserted you, didn't he? He was, I thought he was here for a minute. Oh, oh man, okay. That's all right. So happy new year, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well tonight. Uh, just wanna go through our uh, normal reports. First is the available lot inventory uh, through December. Uh, similar to, to Tanya, we, we did our monthly report. We will get our yearly report to you uh, at next month's meeting. Uh, our available lot inventory as of December, the end of December 2022, is 1,010 available lots. That is up a little bit from last month, about 30 lots uh, from what it was last month. Uh, we had a small run of subdivision sections be approved or recorded, I should say, at the Register of Deeds office at the end of the month on the 28th, as a matter of fact. So that kind of uh, pushed our numbers up a little bit. And you can see how that compares uh, from this time last year where we were at 675 available lots. Again, I think a lot of it's just a, a product of uh, what we're dealing with right now in the economy. Uh, you've got higher interest rates. Uh, people just aren't building houses as fast right now. So building activities down in a lot of these sections that were in the pipeline, they're trying to get them recorded and on the ground. So we're just seeing a little bit of a glut right now as far as that goes. So if there's no questions on that, uh, I will go into our rezoning requests. Uh, we will have two requests for your consideration at next week's meeting. The first is for property uh, by, uh, it's located along Franklin Road, Jeffrey Turner. He's asking for property to be rezoned from residential medium density to commercial services. He states he'd like to zone this property for a business rental type facility. He envisions a pre-engineered building, 10 to 15,000 square feet. Doesn't have an end user at this point, but feels that the zoning is consistent with other properties in the area. And if you look at the maps on your iPad, you will see that there are several other commercially zoned properties in the vicinity of this particular property. Uh, they will continue to access uh, Franklin Road, and of course they will have to provide landscape buffering against any residentially zoned properties as well as our, meet our performance standards. The Planning Commission did ask the applicant again about the specific intent for the property. He did answer that he did not have a end user at this time. Uh, there were also questions about septic on the property. He does say that the, the applicant stated that there is an existing system on the property. There was a house on the property at one time. Of course, they'll have to work with TDEC to make sure that uh, that would be uh, acceptable for use. Uh, there was a neighboring property owner who did have some questions about what was being proposed. He went over, the applicant went over his plan again and there were also some questions about the buffering which were discussed. But following the public hearing, the uh, Planning Commission did recommend approval of that request by a unanimous vote. The second request is for property located along Armstrong Valley Road. This is uh, John Harney representing Thor Sport Incorporated. They are currently zoned residential medium density and they're asking for agricultural residential, which is a down zone, and the size of the property is about 40, uh, 44 acres in size. Uh, the applicant states that they would like to operate a large animal veterinary practice on the property. Uh, they currently operate that now as part of Thor Sport for their own horses, but they'd like to kind of branch out to uh, take other large animals and horses at that facility. So that use would be classified as an agricultural sales and service in our zoning ordinance, which is not allowed in RM, but is allowed in the agricultural residential, the AR zone by special exception. Since these, there's two properties actually involved, they're both over five acres in size, they do qualify for the AR zone. Also, the zoning in and of itself does not approve the business. They know that they do have to go before the Board of Zoning Appeals for the special exception should this be approved. Uh, there wasn't much discussion on this at the Planning Commission. Uh, the applicant did clarify that the request was for the entire property. Uh, to include the rest of the existing farm of those 44 acres and following the public hearing, no one really, no one spoke and the Planning Commission did recommend approval by a unanimous vote. So again, those are the two requests that will be coming before your, uh, before our meeting next week. Uh, you'll see on the uh, first page of the 
report, the first and second page of the report. Planning Commission also considered some regulation changes to the subdivision regulations. Those stay at the Planning Commission, they don't come forward uh, to the County Commission. But just to give you just a quick overview, uh, the Planning Commission did uh, uh, vote to change the regulations to allow staff to administratively approve minor final plats of five lots or less provided no waivers are granted. Uh, you'll recall there was a resolution that went to the county commission last month because the state law states that you, the legislative body has to grant the planning commission that authority. So that resolution was approved and uh, this was also approved at the planning commission. So everything was fine there. Uh, there was a second change that was made uh, regarding right-of-way dedication for new developments. This is something, again, a state law change that was made. We had to add some verbiage to our subdivision regulations just to stay consistent with what the state law is. And then the one that drew the most uh, discussion was the subdivision regulation amendments. We were proposing to look at several different things as far as fire hydrant spacing and fire flow requirements. After a lot of discussion in the public hearing, ultimately what the Planning Commission did was voted to approve uh, fire hydrant spacing requiring to be changed from 1,000 feet, what it currently is, to 500 for subdivisions of six lots or greater while leaving the existing spacing of 1,000 feet for subdivisions of five lots or less. They also did recommend a change to the sprinkler requirement from any subdivision greater than two lots to any subdivision greater than five, and I'll discuss that in a little more detail here in just a minute. Uh, but uh, that's just an overview of the changes. Those last three to the subdivision regulations, again, will not come before the county commission, just those two rezoning changes. So a lot of information there, just to be happy to answer any questions. Anything for Doug? Robert? You said you'd go into a little more discussion on the one about the sprinklers. Yes, sir. So I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> uh, in order to have any kind of a mandatory sprinkler requirement, the state law requires that the legislative body pass a separate resolution to that effect. They did that uh, 10 plus years ago whenever that last one was approved. Uh, for the two lots, anything less than uh, three lots, so basically anything less than sorry, greater than three lots or greater, we would require a sprinkler requirement if it needed a fire hydrant waiver. What this would do uh, would be to just raise that from anything from three lots or greater to six lots or greater, just to be consistent. Now that resolution, that was gonna be the last thing I was gonna say. I'm gonna push that to next month because the resolution, we're still looking at that. It was kind of a, a victim of the holidays. Unfortunately, we didn't get the final draft in time for the meeting tonight. It doesn't really affect anything of what we're doing right now, but we're gonna push that off into next month. Well, that's why I asked you to explain or basically what you're saying right now, if there's three lots and there's no hydrant available, they would have to sprinkle. Correct, if they require a waiver, now, that's what correct. What you're saying, proposing is you could have six lots, no sprinklers, or five lots with no sprinklers and five no lots hydrants. Five lots and less, correct. And no hydrants. They would have to get a waiver to that provision, but yes. Or at least not a, a fire hydrant within a thousand feet. So that's correct. So, so you'd have to get a waiver. Correct, put yeah. A subdivision. That's right. Okay. Regardless, they would have I, to get I a I understand waiver. it now. I just okay. want to make sure I, I did. Yes, you're correct. But that, again, that resolution will come before you at next month's meeting. We'll have that shored up by then. And that's all I have. D Doug, if you could refresh my memory, the rezoning on Franklin Road. Yes, sir. Uh, it not on that because there's not an end user at this point. Uh, we have the ability to require a traffic study if we need to whenever we see a site plan, but uh, we couldn't require one because he was just asking for a conventional zone, not a plan development. So at site plan, get another shot at it. Correct. Thank you. Anything else for Doug? All right, we need a, a approval for his report. Motion to approve, to approve the report. We have a one and two, Joshua. All those in favor? Any opposed? Doug, what else you got? That's all I have, thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, Bishop? Chairman Cush? Yes, sir. Before Bishop gets started, when the guy from Waste Away was here giving his presentation, he made the comment about the city The city had, had offered uh, to share the cost of the transfer stations and all. 
Why was that information not put out to this committee? Well, because that information is still um, this being discussed between the two mayors and their count, their city uh, uh, admin, administrator. When, when when Waste Away talked about um, the proposal of bringing uh, the opportunity for the county to participate in the transfer station, why hasn't the Public Works Committee? Well, yeah, why why hadn't that been brought to the committee? Uh, and I hope this committee and the commission understands that I bring everything for you get to you guys. Um, but there's nothing to bring yet. I mean. Literally, Commissioner Piercy, the discussions have just started. We received, the mayor's office received, I think, an interlocal agreement um, a month ago. And at that time, that was premature because we hadn't even sat down and talked about uh, what would go in an interlocal agreement, much less why we received some. So it was just a little premature. And then with the holidays and everything, I haven't had an opportunity to sit down uh, with Mary McFarland or Craig Tyndall or even Darren Gore privately to discuss, okay, what does this look like? Let's look at the pro forma. So when he mentioned, uh, Mr. Gore mentioned uh, getting me the spreadsheets, literally that'll be the first time I get to see them. So there's just nothing for me to present, that's why, literally. There's been no real meat to mm -hmm. anything. It's all been, man, gee whiz, wouldn't this be cool if we partnered on this and then if we did a north one, we'd partner. That, that's been the extent of the conversation. And, and, the fo and the focus has been a transfer station, most likely for Rutherford County at the county landfill. And so that's been our focus. And then recently, uh, Murfreesboro accelerated their waste away solution with a transfer station. And then they just literally in the last week or two, they've reached out to us and said, when do you want to sit down and discuss the potentials uh, Butler Drive site, I, you know, let's do that first first of the year uh, available. So uh, we're going to sit down and talk to them. And when I get information, Commissioner, you will be the first to receive it. And I mean that sincerely. Well, you know, maybe it's just me, but it seemed kind of odd. Somebody in Warren County knew it and we did not. I, so. I, I, sh I, share, I share that point of view, but I can promise you that didn't come from the Rutherford County Mayor's office. I can promise you that. Good evening, commissioners. Um, last month, Rutherford County Landfill accepted 119.72 tons of brush for a revenue of $3,602. We also managed 1,719 tires for a revenue of $1,699 for a total combined revenue of $5,301 for the month of December. That brings the total amount of brush managed in 2022 to 2,818.98. I don't have the total for the tires. I'll have that by next month. Uh, the, my admin that set up the report was actually out today, so I didn't have access to that data. I'll bring it in to you for, for next month's report for the total for the 2022 tires. Rutherford County Solid Waste disposed of 2,834.64 tons of waste from all sources in the month of December. Uh, 2,377.43 tons were from, from convenience centers and 4,500, uh, 500, excuse me, 457.21 were from Rutherford County Schools. We recycled 370.73 tons from all sources, and that gave us a monthly diversion rate of 13.1%. This brings the total amount of county collected residential waste in 2022 to 3,685.52 tons, with 5,610.65 tons recycled. That's a 15.3% residential diversion rate. Any questions? What? The solid waste I get, we're getting it from all over, tires and brush, all over as well. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Bishop. That's all I have for my reports. All right. Need a motion for approval. 
Motion to approve. And a second from Joshua. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, what else you got? Before that you start, I have a question about the landfill. Is the contract up for rebidding for the excavation work and all that goes on at the landfill, or is it still tied? It's, it was extended for a year about six months ago, so there's six months left on the continuing contract. Um, oh, just a real quick comment. Um, this past holiday season, our convenience centers saw an absolute record amount of traffic. Uh, number one, because of the ice storm, the way the holidays um, laid out across a, um, a weekend where they had Friday, Saturday, Sunday off, the roads were bad, it was cold. Um, and I'm going to just tell you, uh, Bishop Wagner and his team did an absolutely phenomenal job. Um, we got some help from Chris Clark at EMA. We had some help from the Sheriff's Department. Um, it was, y'all didn't know, which is a good thing, but this guy right here did an absolutely incredible job managing a horrific situation that was no fault of his whatsoever. So, Bishop, thank you very much for the work and the work of your team. You did a great job. Thank you, Mayor. Good job. Thank you. Yes, Joshua. Hey, Bishop, I, I wanted to say I appreciated when I, saw, I went out and saw both uh, the one out in Christiana, both the, the Phoenix Center out there in Allenville specifically. Um, jokingly, uh, I spent a good half hour with the, the deputy that was out there and jokingly told him he must have worked at Disney World the way he had the lines all crisscrossed. But my c constituents out there really do appreciate you trying to help as best you can to get the traffic flow back under control. It was my pleasure. Thank you. And yes. Bill. Thank you, Chairman. Um, 36,000 total tons for the year? Yes, sir. Are we down 12,000 tons from no, our so old averages, or are they bad we, averages? I, this is the, the material that we've handled. I'm wondering, I, when I saw this, this number, I totaled it up today about two hours before I came in. So I still have to do some QAQC on the collection methodology to see if there's something that we missed in our collection. Um, Typically what this what happens is I'll compare it against what the state offers when I go in to put the annual progress report in So that'll tell what middle points reported as well um, There are a couple things that could have happened. We just could have missed some collection from our our method that we use it And we also could see an uptick in waste that's going to third-party residential collection companies um, so the I'm, I can assure you that we're not receiving less waste, uh, but I, it may not be passing through the convenience centers as, as directly as it had been in the past. But I would say by, by April, I should have all of the data back from the state that I can do my comparisons and I should have a solid number for you by then. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Any old, any old business? Robert. Well, uh, excuse me. Well, no, it's something new I wanted sure. to bring up. It's something I wanted to mention. I, I'm planning on bringing this up in, in budget, but it's related to this committee, and I, I don't like anybody to be blindsided. Or, and I've mentioned this before in some places. And, and what it is, of course, we meet with our legislative body uh, in January. I forget the exact date. 17th. 17th. Okay. Tuesday. At any rate, one of the things that came to mind, and, and this was not originally my idea, uh, but we have a lot of rental property here in the county. Now, don't anybody jump to conclusions about what I'm going to say, but a lot of uh, the problems that I worry about is the growth that we're getting, the cost of our housing, that kind of thing. And, and I have read where in certain parts of our country there are huge corporations that are moving in, they'll buy up a whole subdivision, and every bit of those houses in that subdivision will become rental property. Now, our sing single family homes are taxed at a lower rate than a commercial rate. Now, I understand that there are people that are relying on a house that they're renting, you know, mom and pop, they've got an extra, they've got, say, one home, or maybe even two, and that's how they're, you know, uh, making a living along with their retirement. Now, I'm not talking about going after someone like that and changing that rate from single family to commercial. But 
there's some point in there, you know, it might be five, could be 10, it'd certainly be 50, that it becomes a business and should be taxed at a commercial rate. And that's something I wanted y'all to kind of have an idea of. Uh, I think to get that done, we'd have to have our legislators buy into that. And anyway, that's one of the questions I was gonna forward to Chairman Harris or our, our legislators. The second thing I wanted to mention, I'll try to keep mentioning this, because I'm bad about forgetting, although I've already filed mine, we all have to file our financial disclosure by January 31st, so you new guys don't forget that. So. Thank you for that reminder. Uh, uh, any, anything else? This uh, meeting is adjourned. <laughs>